Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure we'll have some people join us. Uh, and I just want to take a look at, we're on module one, and that's the dates, uh, the, uh, it's like the 5th, the 7th, and the 9th. And of course on the 7th, which is Wednesday, we'll have a virtual day, then Fridays are just on your own. Those are days to get your, take your exams and finish up your work. So, uh, Let's try kind of how I've evolved this thing to include it. We're going to, we're, I want to take a look for a moment and just kind of get us squared away in terms of what we've got coming up. And knowing plastics, and then you have exam cha cha on, on chapters one and two that are due on the ninth, which would be um, Friday. And I want to talk a little bit about knowing plastics and, and, and what we're going to be doing with it. And You'll be playing around with the saw with the uh, with the goal seat. Now you should, if you haven't, be logged in so you can access uh, so you can get to a Microsoft Excel. But I want to take uh, open up Excel for just a minute and talk about the what if tools that are there, and those are those are the ones that we're going to be working with. One of the reasons that that spreadsheets have pretty much revolutionized business is because they allow us the capacity to ask the question what if to go through those kinds of scenarios and to get over there you'll want to click data okay? and then you'll see the what if analysis and there are three tools the goal seek the data table and the scenario manager now we did a day, if you took 1123 with me we did a data table Okay, which let us do a sensitivity analysis, and I think it was we looked at different interest levels or, or capital hurdle rates versus uh, I think it was initial uh, annual income or initial investment or something of that sort. The goals and these move from complexity. The data table is the most complex, and the and let's just take a lot of variables and look at them and see how changes in those affect an outcome or what or or possible outcome. Then the scenario manager is one where we change some variables and we can save those scenarios. And if you took 1123, we did that a few times where we just we changed some numbers and save them. And then goal seek is probably the simplest where we just work with one variable and we see how that changes a particular outcome or we target an outcome. Now, you should have solver and or the and the data analysis tool pack on your on your Excel. And if you don't, again, uh, once you've got into VMware, which is the uh, which is the cloud thing they're using now, you'll want to go down to options, and then you do add-ins. <clears throat> excuse me, and then you're going to go ahead and, and choose if they're not if it's not in the active list, you you select that and then press go, and you're and you're and it will show up in the far right hand side under the data tab. Okay, now. Before I get off and we look at, at Nolan, and that in that case is over on pages 24 through 27, and it uses, we use Goal Seek to do some work with break even analysis. I want to take a little bit of time out of chapter two just to walk you through, as we've talked about, okay, this idea of, of building some mathematical models. If we can build a mathematical model of something, then we can simulate it. And if we can simulate it, we can see far, far cheaper uh, and easier what, the, what, what are the possible outcomes. Management science is all about saying, okay, what are the, what's, the, what are the, what are the, what's the range of possible outcomes that I can end up with, okay? And good managers think like that. They don't think that this is a binary situation because it's not decisions tend to have, there are two things that are important to remember about them. Number one is they run along a continuum. Number two, they're always subject to the law of unintended consequences. And so the text over in chapter, over in chapter two walks you, walks you through simple minimization and then they take you to the graphical solution procedure. Now if, you, if you're a math geek and you really love doing this stuff, chapter two will be great fun for you because they will walk you through the mathematics of you know computer creating a chart, okay, and finding the feasible area, and they talk about that over in pages really on, on 35, 
show you some of those examples 35 all the way over to uh, over to and even get the it's the parking problem they go all the way over to page 43 and what they basically do is they use linear algebra to find the area that the area that contains an, uh, optimal solutions or what they would call the feasible region and if you look over at page 43 figure 29 you're going to see that okay you'll see where they have a maximum they're ma doing a profit maximization problem and they find the optimal solution along that line versus the, and the, this is a, this is one of their products a standard bag they produce the number of those versus deluxe bags so that's a, what we call a load balance problem where i have two different types of pro two different models of a different product for example and I charge different prices what combination of those gives me the maximum profits and of course you could see the line and we assume there okay a linear trend a linear relationship because that's what we see and then there within that in that darker blue is is the range of feasible solutions okay now there's an optimal point we try to find this and if you're a finance major and you've, and you've had enough courses you this probably looks a whole lot like uh, optimizing uh, the uh, the the outcome the outcome region for a portfolio okay it's basically the same kind of thing well the machine will do this for us but if you want to you can always uh, feel free to get in there and draw a graph and spend that kind of time although the machine will will walk it walk us through that and I'm gonna open up solver for just a minute okay Let's see if I can get it to open up for me. And I want, and this is just this is an empty dialog box, but this is the process that we're going through now. The software will do the, the lifting computationally for you and me. Where you and I have to be smarter than the software is we, we have to understand what type of problem we're dealing with. Okay, that's first. Secondly, we've got to understand the variables and the constraints that are involved. And three, we need to have we need to have a sense of how outcomes are going to be distributed in in a spatial in, in, in a spatial way here's what uh, or, or spatially excuse me now if you look at the top you're going to see here we're going to set an objective okay then we got one of three we've got one of three types of things we can do and all problems boil down to this i have a target value or i try to minimize something or i try to maximize it so i'm trying to do one of those three things Okay, that's where you come in. And as a manager, you know, if it, you, you should know, you know, we're trying to maximize profits, we're trying to minimize costs, we're trying to make, maximize uh, uh, the number of people served by minimizing the number, of, uh, the, the amount of time it takes to serve them or, or, ch or changing something, say, in terms of, of the queuing arrangement. And we'll see that when we get into look at queue st queuing studies. Then, we have to know what variable set, what variables we're working with, and that's why they're talking about changing the variable cell, and then whatever constraints we have. So as we're going through the book, and you'll see they'll go here are the constraints, here's this that. Understand that this is almost like you're looking at maybe a pro forma of some kind, or you're looking at a ledger from a, from a set of accounts, uh, and you're seeing data summarized. The really hard part is is the digging in and figuring out. Okay. What are the what constraints are we working with? What should they be? Okay, and trying to figure out okay the the changing variables. Which one? What, what do we want to work with there? The constraints are probably the more, most difficult. Now, the textbook doesn't talk much about this because this is just an introduction to management science. But most of the time, you can go get data that will help you with constraints. Say, especially around some things like. Uh, if it's in a manufacturing setting, that's pretty easy. How much time would be spent at a workstation, et cetera. There will be industry standards because everybody's kind of figured all that out. Okay. Now, when you come down, the final part is this, understanding how data points are distributed. Now, if it's a simplex LP, it's going to look, off, it's going to look like what you see over in Chapter 2. In other words, the data... If you look at the bottom page 36 or 37, the data are linear in nature, okay? And so since they're linear in nature, unless it's kind of a unique problem, the feasible boundaries are going to, the feasible boundaries are going to be that triangle underneath that line. Now, 
The next is what we call a GRG nonlinear, and that's where we, we cannot assume that the relationship's linear. The data are distributed differently, okay? And we'll work on a few of those problems. And some of those are gonna be things like the uh, Poisson, where we talk about queuing problems where we have arrival times of, of customers and it kind of stair steps its way up and ramps up and then ramps back down. Then we have those of, uh, that we call evolutionary, which we have absolutely no idea. So what we're doing is we're trying to say, okay, what we do is we, we, we set up, math, we build the mathematical model, we plug in the data and we take a look at the possible outcomes, okay? This is, this is probably one of the most powerful tools that we have is because if we can do this, then we can look at what are the range of possible outcomes before we take action, okay? Every decision is about that. And if you've had a class with me where we talked about known and unknown states of nature, you think of it like a matrix, known and unknown states of nature or conditions versus known or unknown actions I can take to deal with those, I'm always trying to push the unknown back a little bit, okay? So I, can, uh, so I have a good idea of how to work with the problem and I understand the problem that I'm dealing with so I kind of have a good idea of what to do. That's, that's the whole point. That's what you get paid for doing. You're always looking for what are the most likely outcomes from a decision so you have a range, okay? And you don't get surprised if you, if you, if you, if you have, if you have a binary mode and the way you think it's going to be this or that, good or bad, you're out of luck. And if you don't remember or plan for, or think about what would be the unintended consequences, then you really are not, you're not thinking at the level uh, of really good business people or really good business leaders. There are people who just intuitively are like that. Uh, a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, they just have that, uh, they have that, they just, they have the gene. And normal people like me, you have to go to school and study this to understand it, okay? And one of the things we'll see as we work through these problems is that the whole idea is that, it, well, we're gonna work with just about every kind of problem you can conceivably come up with in, 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 in any discipline, finance, marketing, scheduling, all of that type of thing. And when you leave the course, hopefully you'll have a, a healthy respect for saying, okay, maybe this is how I ought to make decisions. Maybe this is how I need to think uh, about, you know, about how our business operates. Certainly people who are successful do this uh, they either, they're it's either intuitive or they discipline their organization themselves to do it. So that's, that's something I really wanted to, to emphasize to you that these graphical uh, solution procedures, I don't put much emphasis on them and the machine will do it already for you. The problem is it's what you put in the blender. Okay. If you put the right stuff in the blender, you'll get the right thing. Um, now, I wanted to spend some time today and we'll look at this, looking, just take a little bit of time to look at Nolan Plastics, okay? And I'm gonna go back over to the modules area. And that's due the 9th, which is Friday. And now, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this right here. I'm gonna throw it in a notepad. And this shows you where it's at, where you'll find it, okay? And then I ask you to use the goal stick to change the selling price per unit to get a total profit of 5,000 bucks and just to use that goal stick. Now, you say, okay, where will I find the files? Let's go to the files. Okay, navigate over there. And then we're gonna come down and you're gonna see the management science web files. Got it? As you come over, it's a, it's, a, it's a zip file, and you want to download it. And it, when you're working with these files, I can't emphasize this enough. Understand something. The way that this is constructed is that when you open a file here in, in, in the LMS, it's kind of in a limbo status. The system's kind of evaluating it. So if you don't take it down to your desktop, save it, and sometimes even have, you may have to even rename it, you're gonna have problems with it, okay? So this one's gonna be over on chapter, uh, I think chapter 
one. Let's open that up and see if we can find it. And there's no one. Okay. Now I'm going to open no one up and then I'm going to save it down on my desktop. And you can save it, you know, just you know, case one or whatever you choose to do. It's going to be in your bin anyway, so I'll know, I know it's from you. And I'm just going to call this Nolan. Uh, man, I put Harmon behind it. And the whole idea is just to kind of get us acquainted with these what if tools and to kind of walk into it very gingerly using the uh, starting with the goal seek. Okay. All right, now this is a, this is a pretty this is a simple break-even problem, and the text does give you a little bit of a review of of of, uh, of the um, the break-even, and I'm got this is over in appendix one twenty. So let's take a look over at page twenty-four to twenty-seven for a minute, and put the and put this into context and kind of walk through it. It's always a good idea when you come to class. Uh, or if you review this, to have the book with you so you can kind of get an idea of what we're working with because it is a case study. This is what this is a very simple load balancing problem. You say, what, what do you mean? Okay, well, as you walk through the case over there, 24 through 27, you're going to find, okay, that they sell two different models, okay, of product. And so you're trying to figure out, all right, how do I, how do I keep this, the, the fixed cost, the variable cost, the sunk cost, all in a level where I want to hit a certain, uh, I want to hit a certain level. So we're setting a target there. Now, I'm going to click on the data, and I'm just going to say instead of uh, 5,000, okay, and I can go ahead and copy this, if, and to make it easier on yourself, after you do, what I do is I would copy what I ask you to do, okay, and just insert it as a text file. All right, so you've got it right there in front of you. And uh, I'll just. Insert. And let's find a little text file. Um, well, this is, in, this is interesting. My brain goes dead at always the most inappropriate time. I just want to put it in as a text file. I'll say so I insert. Run on the screenshot on a text file. Where in the world is a text file for this deal? Huh? Uh, where at? Oh, text box. Okay, thank you. There we go. Now, let's pop that baby in. I didn't, obviously, I didn't copy it, so I'll copy it. Control C and Control V. All right. Now we're just now again. If you want, you can go ahead and get this up to a uh, format text size that works for you. Now I said we want to use the goal seek to change the selling price per unit to get a total profit of five grand. That's the problem. Let's say, for example that I want to uh, get the, to get a total profit of $20,000 if I possibly can. Well, I'm gonna click on data, okay? Then I'm gonna come over to the what if analysis and, uh, and I'm gonna click on goal seek and it's gonna say set sell and I want to do the selling price, okay? So I'm gonna choose the selling price that's gonna be over here in C7, all right? And I instead of 5,000 bucks, I want you know $15,000. Okay, uh, let's see, I want to set the sell, pardon me. I want my total profit, I apologize. Total profit. So I, inst I want to do B18, okay, which is the total profit, and I'm going to set that to 15,000 bucks, okay, by changing the sell B7, which is the selling price. Got it? So B18 is the total profit, Okay, and I want to set that to 15,000 and by changing the selling price per unit. And let's see what we can do. Okay, that gives us a solution. 
okay? We would produce 800 units and we sell them at 25,000 bucks a pop. You say, now, this is so simplistic, why would I use it? Well, let's say that you've done some good market intelligence and you know the range of prices uh, that your competitors are offering, okay? Now, if at this volume level, you know, this small volume level, it's not appreciable enough to really see, but let's say you're selling 25, 50, 100,000, a million units of a product, and you can change it by four or five cents and really make a difference. Because you say four or five percent of that, is, it becomes some real money. So you can do this, okay, and use it to look at what would be some of the different scenarios. Now, again, I would probably want to say, all right, uh, I would run this through several times. And again, the best data are going to be either industry data or data that you have that are historical. If you have no idea what it will be, then you really are kind of working in the dark and you have to be really sensitive to the distribution of these data, okay? Meaning you gotta be sensitive to what will look like, what will probably be the, in, in the main area, what would be a standard devi deviation above, two standard deviations above, and always remember within the normal curve, so-called, if data are distributed that way, data points, 68% of them are one standard deviation below or above the mean, then you add 14% on each end, so that's 96% are gonna be somewhere between two standard deviations above or below the mean. So we say, okay, we gotta sell uh, 25, uh, we gotta sell 800 of these at 25 bucks to make our $15,000 profit. Is it feasible to sell that many? Okay, that's again is a marketing decision. So these, these kinds of tools, uh, this is the simplest of it, but again, it takes some thought because you're gonna have to have some good data in terms of variable cost per unit. You're gonna have to know that. You're gonna have to know the selling prices. That's probably gonna be a marketing issue. And the variable cost, then you get, of course, the total cost. Total cost less the variable cost is gonna be the fixed cost. And the variable cost is a cost that varies with what? The number of units I sell. The more units I sell, the higher the variable cost, the lower uh, per unit, the, uh, the lower the number. Uh, but it just works, that's <laughs> how it works. You've had enough economy to know that by now. So it, it probably would involve a collaborative process, but this would be the first step, okay? Now, if you wanted, if you said, well, I really just don't have any idea, you could always go ahead with this and you could, and you could simulate it a little bit. And let's do that when we've got, to, let's say, okay, we'll stick with this. And I'm going to do just a little simulation. I, I'm coming down here to sell F24, uh, I'm going to put trial, okay? And I'm going to do five trials. Okay, I've got five trials, and then I'm going to put in the value, okay? And I can, and I can utilize either the random or the rand between functions. Now, I like rand between because it, number one, rand between does have a, does have a deficiency in the sense that you can't use, you have to use whole numbers. But it's a good way to say, okay, what's the ceiling, what's the floor? And we were talking about, uh, you know, a selling price per unit, okay, um, to get to that fifteen thousand dollars. So let's say, okay, based upon we've done mar we've done some market intelligence, and the marketing people say, I'm going to put equal ram between, and the uh, the and, and let's now before we go any further, just a reminder. You can always click on the FX to see the dialog box and it will explain to you each piece of the dialog that you need. So I'm gonna put in uh, the bottom of this is gonna be, I think, uh, selling price per unit. The discounters are gonna sell it at, eh, I don't know, let's call it 18 bucks, okay? And the top price, we'll go ahead and say, well, let's set that parameter as 25. You say, well, where'd you get that? Well, I know the profit I want to sell I want the profit I want to make. So to get there, I've got to sell. I've got to sell them at 25 bucks a pop. Okay. 
Now I've got these values, okay? And I, and I can just go ahead and count it all down. And now I've randomized these values. Then I can just go ahead now you know, and just start throwing them in there to see what kind of profits I get. Got me? The one thing you have to be a little bit careful with is in Excel. One of its uh, shortcomings is that when you work with random numbers, they're volatile. You can go in and fix Excel so it's not volatile. But if you do that, you give up some. You give up some. Uh, you give up some um, accuracy out to several digits. So what I would do is I'd say, okay, I've got these values here, and I might copy and paste them, okay, as as trial one, and then I can go ahead and come back here. And I can run it again. And I can, so I basically have done a simulation of that price. You follow me? That's what good decision makers do. Now, you're going to be working for people or with people who that's all in their head. And let's go, well, let's try this or that. Okay. The beauty of it is I can see what this will look at. And what I would do afterwards is once I've worked through several of these, uh, it's just, uh, so how many I, should I simulate? Well, the, the truth is the more simulations you perform, okay, the higher, the, the, the better, it's the law of large numbers, okay? The more sampling you do, the closer you're gonna get to the, to the, to the actual so-called value. You have to ask just what's the cost? Well, it's a little bit of time. So you do this before you, you know, I see, you know, I, I know that marketing people are, you know, are taught, you know, you do an alpha beta kind of thing. You, you may be to do some pricing, uh, to, to, to get some pricing strategies established, but this is maybe a, a cheaper way to do it. Now this assumes, okay. And you would want to probably put somewhere. What is the, what's the, what's the price or the market ceiling? What's the market floor? <clears throat> And so, you, and, and have data to back that up so you know what you're dealing with. Got me? Now the cost data is the same kind of issue. You say, so I could come in perhaps if I wanted to, and instead of looking at the selling price per unit, I could use the goal seek to say, okay, what should be the, what should, would be the fixed cost per unit? And again, that would either be historic data or it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be in, industry data, maybe a mix of both. And you could simulate that again. Okay. The beauty of this is, is this is not too hard, but but the beauty of it is is that it gives you so much a better picture of how things will 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 flow, and so you can start to get that sense of where. And we've got the two ceilings there, obviously. Okay. 18 and 25. It's all the stuff in between. Now, if I'm at either at 18 or 25, the one variable I'm, the one thing in here that concerns me the most is this. Why? Because that's going to drive the amount of my, re, my, the amount of uh, revenue per unit I have towards the contribution margin. And the contribution margin is the fixed cost per unit less the variable cost per unit. That is uh, uh, the revenue per unit minus the, the, uh, the variable cost per unit, which leads me to what I got to pay, how much I have per unit to pay a fixed cost. Got me? So there's even in this little simplistic value of thought, uh, in this little simple exercise, there's a whole lot of food for thought. Okay? A again, Garbage in, garbage out. And the reason that we try, the reason I encourage folks to do this is very simple. If you could simulate out, you know, 50 trials, 100 trials, whatever, it's a lot, it's a lot cheaper, a lot easier, and a no pain, but maybe potential big gain kind of deal versus say, just setting the price. Now, unfortunately for you, you don't get a pricing class. I've been one of the people who've been the curmudgeon on the faculty who said, you need a pricing class, you need a pricing class. Pricing, unfortunately, is done by most organizations 
as a function of their budget, not a function of the market. I mean, you stop and say, think about that. You go, ooh, because prices are signals to markets. Any finance major will tell you that. Berkshire Hathaway is pretty expensive, isn't it? Why? It's a signal how valuable it is. Amazon, how valuable it is. Or how it's losing value based upon what's happening in this market movement. Does that make sense? All right. That's the thing about management science that I think is that, that's so interesting to me is that it's really, it's just, a lot of it's just common sense, kind of disciplining your mind to make, to make a decision. Now, you don't, again, there are people who inhabit planet Earth who just kind of have a knit, uh, feeling for this. They just kind of have it. They can do it in their head or they can do it in the back of an envelope and they got it. Normal people like you and me need to do this. And remember, always, when I'm involved in business, I'm always thinking about the risk. Now, let me ask you a question. I use the, I use this, uh, I use this, when we did this RAND between, I put it between 18 and 25, okay? What if I said it varies between 12 and 31, which is riskier, a range of 18 to 25 or a range of 12 to 31? Which one do you think is riskier, huh? The bigger one, why? Exactly, exactly, exactly. When you see great dispersion, okay, of prices in a market for a good, okay, and if you're assuming it's a, a variable in good, then you have a very risky proposition. Now, if you notice, if you keep track, uh, big ticket items, automobiles particularly. The automotive, the people that run the autom automobile companies would, would say, oh, we don't ever collude on pricing. We never collude, and they don't. However, they send signals like $5,000 off or 0% or this or that. Why? Because they're trying to say to each other, they're giving each other signals. Okay? Now, Nobody can prove that because if the government could prove it, they'd go in and tear them apart, but they can't, but they do give those signals. And so when, you know, Toyota says, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're going to give you $10,000 off or certain percent of interest, everybody else who sells a product similar to a Toyota truck is going, huh. And the truth is the difference between what it costs to make these vehicles not that much different. There are some things, there are some areas where, 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 where there are differences to account for, but on the whole, your run of the mill types of cars, are, they pretty much cost the same thing, amount to manufacture because so many of their parts are, are, uh, are, are uni uniform in nature. You know, uh, they buy from the same suppliers, brakes, chassis, etc. So there's a lot more in, in this in this uh, in this in this case, or just working around with knowing uh, than would than one would want to do. Now, we use the goal seek to set change the selling price per unit. We could also work with the variable cost per unit. We could work with the, with the fixed cost per unit. Okay. Now let's look at this for just a moment. We saw right, I I have a, I'm going to get it to five thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, $15,000, excuse me. Since I've got that figure there in my head and I know the total cost, okay, then I can start to break down the fixed cost per unit. Okay, and I already know the variable cost per unit. The fixed cost per unit is going to be, what is it, 3000 bucks divided by 800, right? In terms of my scenario. So I want. So now I can start to. The other thing I can do, and we'll get, we'll, we'll see this some more as we work through the through the through the course, is we can do a sensitivity analysis, and that is how much does what which of these variables affects total profits the most? Okay, is it the selling price? Is it the fixed cost? Is it the variable cost? 
Now, tip, normally, it'll be the selling price, okay, because that's the standard by which I subtract the variable cost to get then to the, to the, to the, uh, fixed, the fixed cost per unit, which gives me my contribution margin. But there are some situations where uh, it's those variable costs that become an issue. And those are especially going to be in situations where I have a high labor content in a good, in a good or a service, product service bundle. Food retailers, their biggest battle is what? The, the weekly budget for employee hours. Okay. Everything else is pretty, pretty, uh, the fixed costs, they've got those down to pack. That, that's why they're franchised. Uh, their, their total variable cost, they, they have control over their food. You know, when McDonald's deals with people uh, that sell them beef, you, if you want to continue to work with McDonald's, you sell them beef at a price they want. Just like Walmart says to people, if you want us to carry your goods, you will sell it to us for this, because this is what we need to have per square foot. And you're not going to go, oh, forget it. Where else will you sell it? Not too many places. I guess just try to sell it on Amazon and hope you can survive it, but otherwise you're going to be talking to Walmart. So there's a lot embedded in this case, and the whole point of it is to use this, just this one little simple tool, okay, and I can work through. Now you could, if you wish, take this case and you can work through uh, null and plan, you could try, you could work with the, uh, you could go ahead and try and work with the scenario manager, where you just choose a few of them and manipulate it, but the goal seek is the one that makes the most sense, okay? And then again, you could do a little bit of a simulation, start to uh, start to work through this. You could do as many trials as you want. In fact, we just yeah, we could run a thousand trials. We just down there. Then we could take what? We, then we could take the average, okay, and compute the standard deviation. We could get the variance, which is going to be the which is going to be the standard deviation squared. And then we kind of have a range we're working with. We'd really be interested in one sigma, uh, positive sigma, uh, positive sigma one, negative sigma, one, sigma one, because that's that's the range of about 68 percent, or if the data are distributed normally. That makes sense. You say, could I simulate one for each of the yes? Now you say, well, this sounds this is kind of pesky because this is a simple problem. It could be a lot of work. Yes. Better you do this than you make a blunder and you lose half a million bucks or $20,000 or 50,000 or anything because it's not, you and I aren't playing with our own money. We're playing with the house money. That's usually the investor's money. So we don't want to gamble very much, okay? Other, other than being able to count cards, the best thing that ever happened to human beings is our ability to simulate numbers. If you can count cards, if I could count cards effectively and mask it, I wouldn't be here with you today. I would have long been, I'd be on my luxury yacht somewhere going, well, writing my book about my days as a card counter, obviously, in, uh, in, in, with, an, with a, an, a, um, an alias name, because I, the people in the casinos, I think if they found out you're a card counter and you've done it successfully years and got by them, they might send someone to see you. You never know. Okay. That's pretty much what we'd be working with there on that case number one. They give us they give us some uh, some information there in terms of the break-even analysis, okay. And even again, you want to remember, you know, we we're working with break-even analysis, which is is which is itself a mathematical model, right? That's the valuable part of these. Um, and they do a nice job over there, over in Appendix 1, 1, and that's pages 24 through 27, that talk about determining the, determining the break-even, break-even, and you'll want to go maybe and do, do, do some quick, quick, uh, quick update yourself in terms of the components of break-even, how those are all computed, and then I'll ask you to use that. Uh, change the selling price per unit to get a total profit of five thousand bucks. Now, if I was doing this out in the real world, I'd do the simulation and I'd try to figure out which of these tends to which of what's what is this 
What is it most sensitive to? Variable cost per unit or selling cost per unit? You say, why would you focus on those? Because those are the controllable variables. I can control the selling price. I'm the one that sets it, but you know, tells them here's what it costs, tells them the consumer. I'm the one who's going to control a variable cost. I'm probably not in control of fixed costs. If I am, if this is kind of a project type of situation, then that's a different matter. Make sense? Okay, I'm gonna take a little bit of time also, and we've got eh, about 15 minutes or so, to look at, again at some of the other things we've got coming up. I wanna pop over the modules, okay? And I really do wanna encourage you, let's see, this week, You've got the Nolan Plastics do. You've got the, the, the chapter one and two exams. Those are open book, open note, okay? And those are due on the ninth. I think at five, I think they're, everything's due at five o'clock on the ninth, which is Friday. But I really would like you to come in and take a look at these resources I've got for you here on the GRG nonlinear and the, and the evolutionary. Uh, primarily because as we, it, as we move more and more into digital products, we're, you're going to encounter more and more uh, data that are representative of a transaction that just don't fit the norm. And those are going to be all kinds of data, not necessarily just data from a sale, as we try to assess some type of value. So I, I want you to go over and take a look at that. And of course, then a, the easy solver I'll go over and take a look at that there. The, the Excel Easy is a site I use all the time, okay? And I don't, I'm not ashamed to admit that at all. If you work in a particular industry or you work with a particular type of problem over and over, you're gonna become very, very versed in all of the, in the functions that are appropriate for that type of problem, okay? But if you're not, you need to make sure you kind of approach one of those as you try to solve it or work with it. Or if you have somebody you're in a meeting, someone says, well, I use, I use this function, go over and check it out. A, a, a good example is the NPV function in, in Excel. Most capital projects are not set up like an annuity where you have a, a, the same cash flow year after year. Cash flows in, in, in real projects are up and down. But people will use NPV, okay? And they'll just throw a, a value in there. And, and even sometimes they'll go, well, I'm gonna use an average value. Because it's easier just go ahead and use the NPV and compute that than to figure out the present values for each and every single one. There's, a, I believe the function is called XNPV that lets you handle uneven cash flows. And you say, well, I, I really didn't know anything about those before you told me this today, and I really won't care in my lifetime. And that's fine. <laughs> it, but if you're doing cash flow analysis, I think you'll want to get versed up. So I'm, I'm kind of giving you an, an ad here, okay, for Excel, what it can do, what it can't do. And I use this site. It's a great resource. Uh, and, uh, again, you'll, you'll see some of these different types of problems that they're designed to work with. You say, now you've used this term sensitivity analysis several times, and what do you mean? Well, as we as we get into the as we get into the into the into the course, we're going to see, especially when we use optimization, that we'll be able to see how much values can vary, or in particular when we're doing like resource resource allocation, have we is there is there a slack resource? Okay, real good. A, a really good example would be: let's say I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm Ted's Cleaners, and I've got three workstations. Now I can tell you when I'll be the busiest. I'm going to be the busiest Monday morning, and Monday afternoon, Friday afternoon, maybe Friday morning, because that's when people tend to dump their laundry on on cleaners. So how many people do I want to have in my, in my store, work in the counter? Now I have a drive-by, okay? And, I'm not, and, and, and I, I know some of the drive-by traffic, but I've also got this foot traffic. I have so many cars I can fit in my parking lot. 
and I know pretty much from historical data what you know what the average order is, i.e., how many how many garments somebody uses me. So should I have two people, three people? Should I have one person just work the work the window or what? Sounds like a real simple problem, doesn't it? Well, you may get one of those thrown at you, and, and someone may say, well, we need to figure this out for all 500 of our outlets. And suddenly you're going, oh, no, now I get it. So these, uh, these problems can get pretty complex fast, especially if you're looking at that type of, of, of allocational allocation issue. So you have to have an understanding of how much you impact the variables as you change the equation. And that's, and that's when you'll see that in the sensitivity analysis. Now, if you'll take a look over at chapter, take a look if you would for a moment, please, at page 51, okay, in your textbook. You'll see some output. Now, the, chat, the, the authors of this text, okay, in every edition of this thing have had a little thing they have on the web called lingo where you put in the constraints, you, you type in all the stuff that you put into the dialog box at Excel. And for $150, you'll have that privilege. I chose not to make you do that. And if any of you feel cheated, please let me know and I'll let you go back and you can get your card. Otherwise, use Excel. So you'll see some things in here sometimes with lingo files. Eh, just use Excel. But the point is, is that this, this, uh, th they show you that web file there. This is what you'll see from the lingo is, uh, 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 instrumentation they have over there, but it doesn't matter because if you walk down here, you're gonna see, and, and we'll talk about this some more, how to look at one of these sensitivity analyses and start to, and, and get a feeling, what am I looking at? What's it trying to tell me? You see the objective function, okay? Then you see the variables. This is somebody making two types of products, one's standard, one's deluxe. And then you'll see the values, okay? And did we reduce the cost? And then you'll see the constraints, and you see that thing called slack or surplus, okay? In other words, I have some resources here I could reallocate, okay? So if I've got slack, I'm not being as efficient as I need to be. I have a slack resource. That's the reason there are one-way streets. <laughs> Early on, people in the, in the major thoroughfares in the United States figured out, after we had the automobile, we'd had the automobile, and maybe 10 years, 15 years, people, I think it was starting in New York City, they said, you know, it'd make a lot more sense to flow these people one way because we're getting these massive traffic jams, okay? And that was before everybody had a car. And so you have, you have a, a lane that runs in. In some major cities, you'll, not, you'll notice as you're going in on a daily commute, these two lanes are open. These two lanes are the opposite way, or maybe three lanes you're headed in, you got one headed out, okay? And then in the afternoon commute, it's a different story. You wanna make use of that slack resource. Okay, um, so they walk you through there and they'll show you the variables and then the constraints. And you'll see there, for example, on that variable, that, that constraint number two, you've got infinite slack there. The other is infinite. In other words, you, you, can, you can increase your output or your outcome or your objective function no matter what you do. So we'll talk some about that in terms of, and you see the allowable decreases and increases. The increments, I can ju jump it up or down to get the best result. Does that make sense? I learned about optimization at a very early age. I, well, I, my dad, and he had stores and restaurants and every summer he'd make me work for him in his restaurants I bust tables and wash dishes from 10 in the evening till six at night. I think my father was trying to keep me out of trouble. But we had a, a guy there named JD who was our short order cook in the, in the big restaurant. He could make a steak well done, melt in your mouth. He could throw that in there. He'd be doing six other things. He'd be ringing the bells, hey, here's an order. And then he'd look around and put, 
I thought, how do you, he said, I just know how long to leave it in there. Optimization. And it propelled me into this. That's amazing, isn't it? I got interested in finance. Have you ever heard of Popeye? Popeye the sailor man. And you ever heard about his friend Wimpy? Who says, may I borrow 25 cents from you to buy a hamburger? And what would Popeye do? He'd give him 25 cents to buy a hamburger. I began to think about that. I thought, okay, he's borrowed a quarter. He's eating the hamburger. So Popeye can't go get the hamburger. It's been consumed. So here's what could happen. Popeye could drop dead. Jesus could come. Popeye could forget. Or Popeye remembers and he gets paid. But I like that. And he got me interested in finance. Funny how that all works, isn't it? I will gladly pay you next Tuesday. I would like a hamburger. You'll be doing that on a large scale. Anybody, if you, I won't make your hand, but if you bought your first house or you're on the way, the moment you sit down, every time my wife and I bought a house, we sit down, we look at the total cost of the house, and she goes, <gasps> I said, no, 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 just think about the payment. Think about the payment. Because, you know, when you sit down and you look, it's, you know, $600,000 or some ridiculous figure like that, assuming if you pay all the interest in the mortgage over, you know, 30 years. I said, say, calm down, calm down. It's okay. I said, instead of that, why don't you get, I, I tell her, I said, instead of that, get excited about that Coles card you still, you've owed $900 on for the past 10 years. Let's work on that. Then I'm shamed into silence. I gave you a glimpse of married life. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I had a great wife. Far better than I deserve. Well, my friends, it's 1150. And uh, you'll have this to take a look at. If you have any questions, I'll uh, do the recording on this and post it. And then Wednesday, we'll do a screencast. And that'll be a virtual day. And then you've got your work to do on Friday. Okay? Thank you very much. Take care now. And for all those of you out there, I see Frankie, Gage, Jonathan, Kristen, Lauren, thank you for joining us. Glad to have you aboard. If you have any questions, shoot me an email or I'll try to deal with them right now. Anybody? Okay, you're probably off watching TV or something. All right. Take care now. <laughs>